From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. Tonight, we're continuing our special coverage of the Democratic National Convention. We'll bring in the speeches of prominent Democratic figures, including President Bill Clinton and Dr. Jill Biden, former second lady of the United States. And, and we'll also be getting thoughts on economic and national security leadership from Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute and from former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson. That will be starting at 10 p.m. Eastern time here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. That's all tonight, but... Looking back at last night, it was really given over to party unity, the Democratic Party coming together, including hearing from the Biden, former rival of Biden, Mr. Bernie Sanders, a Vermont senator, who really pledged his solidarity with Joe Biden. But the question is, is there a price for that solidarity? And does it come at a price of perhaps moving the entire party further to the left? To get some sense of that, we welcome now someone with vast experience on Wall Street as well as down in Washington. He is Ralph Schlossstein, co-chairman and co-CEO of Evercore. So, Ralph, great to have you with us always. Uh, you have described yourself on Bloomberg before as a fiscal conservative but a social liberal. Put on the fiscal conservative side for a moment here. Are you concerned that maybe Joe Biden is tacking to the left to make sure he keeps the Bernie bros with him? Not really. Uh, I think if you look at uh, Vice President Biden's record, both in the Senate uh, and when he was Vice President to President Obama, uh, he's very squarely in the left center of the Democratic Party, center of the Democratic Party. Uh, he's a pro-capitalist. I think his selection of Kamala Harris as Vice President who I also believe is pro-capitalism, uh, sets a course that is, in my view, the right course uh, for our country, a commitment to private enterprise, but also to a more balanced uh, distribution of wealth and to uh, access to health care and education uh, as more of a right in our society than a privilege. Uh, perhaps pro-capitalist, but a different sort of capitalism than what we've seen from Donald Trump, I think it's fair to say. A lot of big programs, infrastructure programs, energy programs, education programs that we'll have to pay for either by borrowing or by increasing taxes. We've heard there'll be increased taxes. Are you concerned about that and its possible effects on the markets and really ultimately on the economy itself? Uh, look, I think... Uh, We've had a pretty irresponsible fiscal policy uh, prior to uh, the uh, uh, beginning of the COVID pandemic. Uh, we had a literally a trillion dollar budget deficit at three and a half percent unemployment, uh, which I think is a truly irresponsible uh, policy. If you look at the share of GDP that has gone to federal taxes, it's declined steadily from about 19.5% to 16.5%, which in my view is inadequate to take care of the, the basic needs uh, that we have in government, which is why we were running uh, larger deficits. So I think what we'll find in the Biden administration is uh, perhaps a commitment to uh, a little more of a commitment to things like health care and education than we've seen in the current administration, but very importantly, uh, oh, and certainly a big commitment to infrastructure, but very importantly, uh, a willingness to pay for those commitments so that we're not saddling our children and our grandchildren with unacceptable debts. So, so, Ralph, I think everyone pretty much agrees we have needed to spend money, and that means borrow money, given the real crisis in the economy. Right now, we're taking a look at a, a cliffhanger here with fiscal stimulus. As we thought we were going to get something by August 1st, we now are looking at September. Uh, what is the economy going to look like by November 3rd, whoever wins the election? Well, the economy is uh, it's going to be in recovery, uh, but unemployment is still going to be by far unacceptably high, uh, probably one side or the other of nine or 10 percent. Uh, so we're going to need to have uh, a continued stimulus. I think the plan that is hopefully at some point will be compromised between the, the Democrats in the White House and the Republicans in the Congress uh, is needed for sure. Uh, but once we get on the path of recovery, and, and that will not be really fully done until we have a widely available vaccine uh, and widely available 
uh, therapeutics, uh, because until then, people will be fearful of returning 100% to their lives prior to this. But once we have that, uh, we need to uh, provide more resources through the government. And, and I think Biden has a very intelligent uh, tax plan, part of which is simply reversing some of, uh, but not all of, and certainly the most irresponsible parts of the Trump tax cuts, uh, and also and and paying for uh, the investments that we so uh, strongly need in this country. So, so Ralph, pick up on that for a moment and go to your business quite specifically. I mean, you you guys are the the investment bankers par excellence. Uh, did you see an uptick in business when the rate went down so far for corporations? And then on the flip side, if it went back up to 28 percent, which is what Vice President Biden is talking about, would that hurt your business? Uh, I think really n neither an uptick nor a, a downtick. And let me explain why. Uh, all the corporate rate does uh, is it uh, basically redraws a little bit the line between of the pre-tax earnings, what goes to shareholders, and what goes to the government. Uh, we had a policy that 35% went to the government and 65% went to shareholders. Uh, that was quite honestly out of step and non-competitive with the rest of the world. Uh, I think the, it, generally the majority of the uh, world, the developed world is in the 25 to 28% uh, range. Uh, you know, so the where 25 to 28 percent of the pre-tax profits go to the government and uh, the rest go to shareholders. That's important because we don't want to lose businesses domiciling in the United States because they perceive relative to other countries that too much of their pre-tax earnings are being taken by government. At 21 percent, we're probably out of step a little bit with all but the tax havens uh, in the other uh, direction. So what does this really mean if it goes to 28 percent, as, as uh, Vice President Biden has suggested? Uh, instead of uh, 79 percent of pre-tax earnings going to the shareholders, 72 percent will go. So that's roughly a 10 percent decline in earnings per in earning pre in net income and earnings per share, uh, you know it'll have a, probably a little bit of an effect on the stock market, but that's not a lot more than one year's earnings growth, to be honest. That's fascinating. Thank you so much for that analysis, Ralph. Always great to have you with us. That's Ralph Schlossstein of Evercar. And now we're going to be coming up with the question of blaming President Trump for his response to the coronavirus pandemic, but how would a President Biden handle it? We pose that question to former Biden Chief of Staff Ron Klain. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. One of the things Democrats were united about last night was their condemnation of the way that President Donald Trump has handled the coronavirus crisis. To everyone who supported other candidates in the primary and to those who may have voted for Donald Trump in the last election. The failed federal government that watched New York get ambushed by their negligence and then watched New York suffer but all through it learned absolutely nothing. So today, six months after it began, the nation is still unprepared. Imagine if we had a national strategy. So everyone who needs a test gets one for free. So everyone has access to a safe vaccine. More than 150,000 people have died and our economy is in shambles because of a virus that this president downplayed for too long. The truth is, that even before Trump's negligent response to this pandemic, too many hardworking families have been caught on an economic treadmill. 
We haven't seen anything like this COVID pandemic for at least 100 years, but we have seen epidemics that threaten to turn into pandemics, including with the Ebola crisis, and that was less than a decade ago. Then President Obama appointed Ron Klain. He's former chief of staff to Vice President Biden to head up the government's efforts, and we welcome Ron Klain now to Bloomberg. Ron, thanks so much for being here. Give us a sense of what you did then and what a Joe Biden might do now with this pandemic. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me, David. I mean, look, it starts with putting science at the forefront, not politics. Uh, President Obama made it very clear that while my job was to coordinate the response, the logistics, the planning, the direction, the strategic direction came from medical experts, including Dr. Tony Fauci, who was obviously a key part of it then, key part of it now. I think we've seen this president put kind of politics and spin ahead of science. He's trying to silence the scientists, and that always gets you off in the wrong direction. I think in terms of Vice President Biden's approach to COVID, he laid out a comprehensive plan in March. He updated it in July. At the, at the center of that is having a national strategy. We've let, made each state fight this disease on their own, with their own standards, their own rules, by closing and reopening. That hasn't worked for us. It's allowed the disease to spread from one part of the country to the other. We need a national testing strategy. We need contact tracers coast to coast. We need to really focus on how to get our businesses clear standards and how to reopen safely, how to manage the schools safely. We need to get, obviously, economic aid to our businesses, our state and local governments, to our families. And, of course, we need to put science uh, at the forefront of developing uh, vaccines, developing therapeutics, getting them out affordably and safely to all Americans. And, you know, I think the, that strategy, again, people want to know in depth what Joe Biden would do. It's on JoeBiden.com. They can read it there. But he's had a comprehensive strategy from the start and I think it's a science-based strategy. That's the big difference. Science in the forefront, but what role, if any, does economics play in the equation as a practical matter? Do you solve the equation simply for the public health, no matter what happens to the economy, or do you have to balance the two, or is that a false choice? What is a false choice? Look, we're seeing it right now, David. If people aren't safe, they aren't going to shop. If people don't feel safe, they're not going to go to movie theaters or restaurants. You, you can't have an economy where people feel like engaging in commerce is hazardous to their health. That's just not going to work. And that's what we've seen over the past few months. Moreover, part of fighting the disease is giving help to our businesses. Look, there are places in the country where it's safe for schools to reopen. There are businesses that are safe to reopen, uh, but they need guidance and they need economic aid. It's not fair to ask some small business, say to small business, you can reopen. And by the way, you should protect your workers with protective gear. You should protect them with plastic shields, all these things. But hey, there's no help to do it. There's no aid to do it. So I think that this effort to fight the disease and to fix the economy, they go hand in hand. We're not going to solve one without solving the other. Do we need a new Ron Klain? You were dubbed the czar at the time of Ebola. There were some people when coronavirus came up that said we need just like that, that kind of function. Do we need that kind of function in the White House? We do. I think Vice President Biden's made it very clear. He will bring back what they, President Obama, Vice President Biden, set up at the end of the administration, a pandemic preparedness and response office in the White House run out of the National Security Council. Uh, that was something they created in their administration. Ironically, President Trump kept it for the first year of his presidency and then abolished it in 2018. So he will bring that back on day one. That office will be in the National Security Council. That office will coordinate and run a national COVID response strategy. So, Ron, besides being so-called the Ebola czar and also being chief of staff to both Vice President Gore and Vice President Biden, you also had a very big role in the 2000 election when we had that dispute down in Florida. There was the big recount issue. We all remember the hanging chads. I was at ABC News yeah. at the time. There's a lot of concern this year that it may be far worse because you have a lot of people who are going to be mailing in their ballots. President Trump's been very outspoken about that. It may take a long time to get an answer, and there are going to be a lot of challenges. What is the Biden camp doing right now to prepare for that possibility? Well, first of all, I have to say the biggest lesson I took away from being in a very close presidential election in 2000 is the best thing uh, for your candidate is to not be in a close election. And I think the best thing would be for the Biden campaign to uh, continue to do what it's doing, which is to rally its supporters, to get its voters enthusiastically to vote by mail, by early voting uh, at the polls, we're safe, and, uh, and, and to do all those things to win by enough votes so that all these issues don't really matter in the end. But the Biden campaign is preparing for this. Uh, Bob Bauer, former counsel to President uh, Obama, is overseeing the Biden campaign's multifaceted efforts to prepare for this. We've got the largest 
voter protection effort ever in American history to make sure uh, people get their votes cast and counted safely. I think if you're listening to me right now, the best thing you can do in the vast majority of states that allow this is to get your ballot early and cast it early. If you do that, you're insulated from all of these other challenges, all these other problems. That's in your control. Again, in most states, you can uh, vote absentee, vote by mail, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you can get your ballot early. You can cast it early. And that's the safest thing for you and the safest thing for our democracy. How big a problem might this be? I interviewed recently the co-chair of Lawyers for Trump. He's the Texas state attorney general who says they're getting lawyers pretty much across the country ready to go into court and fight over the ballot box. Do you have lawyers lined up across the country? We certainly do. We have lawyers in every state. Uh, and again, our focus right now is on protecting voters, on getting voters uh, their right to cast their vote and have it counted uh, appropriately. And I think that's the most important thing. We've seen the president try to tamper with the Postal Service and then try to raise fears about it to discourage people from voting. Uh, we want to convey a message that basically uh, you have the right to vote. You can exercise that right. Uh, you can exercise that right by voting by mail. It's safer if you do it early. Many places have early voting, uh, in-person voting early. That's another way to vote. And we're working on strategies for safe voting on Election Day. It's also there are ways in which, again, polls can be run in a way that's safe and secure. The Brennan Center and a group of infectious disease doctors put out guidelines on that this week. So we want people to be confident in the election, we want people to be confident in the vote. We're going to protect people's rights to vote. We're fighting back on voter suppression. But the most important thing people can do is exercise that right. Get that ballot cast, uh, cast your vote uh, as early as possible uh, so that you know your vote counts. Okay, thank you so much, Ron. Really great to talk with you. That's Ron Klain. He's former Biden chief of staff and Ebola czar, as we've talked about. Still ahead, the Democrats' approach to health care. Can we have universal coverage without Medicare for all? We asked Catherine Baker. She's dean of the University of Chicago School of Public Policy. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. The failed federal government that watched New York get ambushed by their negligence and then watched New York suffer, but all through it learned absolutely nothing. So today, six months after it began, the nation is still unprepared. That was New York Governor Andrew Cuomo speaking at the DNC last night. One of the things that divided Democrats in the primaries was Medicare for All and whether private health insurance should be excluded. We welcome now Catherine Baker. She's dean of the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. So, Dean Harris, thank you so much. Dean, I'm sorry, Dean Baker, thanks so much for being with us. This is my basic question. You heard Bernie Sanders last night saying, I agree with Joe Biden we should move toward universal coverage. We just disagree over Medicare for All. Can we have universal coverage without single-payer or Medicare for all? There are a lot of different ways we can get people covered with health insurance. You can expand Medicaid, you can expand Medicare, you can expand subsidies for private health insurance, like through the health insurance exchanges or marketplaces. I think the really important thing is that everyone get access to life-saving care, but I'm suspicious of a one-size-fits-all solution given how very different Americans' preferences are about what their health insurance plans should look like, how the health care infrastructure differs greatly apart across the country. I'm more optimistic about universal coverage that's achieved through giving people subsidies that they can use on different ki kinds of plans issued by different payers. Well, that's interesting. That sounds like you think what Vice President Biden is proposing makes some sense, because he does talk about subsidies as well as ha about having a public option for certain people. Does that plan make more sense to you than Medicare for All? I think giving people more choice and having more competition in delivering not only innovative care, but innovative insurance products is a better way to get us towards higher value care and higher value insurance. Medicare is wonderful for our seniors who are enrolled in it, but it is very slow to evolve. It is very slow to adopt new payment models, to adopt new benefits, and it's not as efficient as one might hope. So having a guarantee of access through subsidies that could manifest in 
health insurance exchanges and expanded Medicaid coverage, I think would go a long way towards getting people access to care without forcing people into one model that may not work for everyone. Catherine, I think one way to look at the last few months has been an extreme stress test of our health care system in the United States of America. What difference, if any, did the Affordable Care Act make? Were we better off to some extent because we had it in place? I think the Affordable Care Act went a long way towards getting access to health care in a crucial pandemic for people who were eligible for Medicaid, especially in states that have chosen to expand it, through more flexible enrollment in health insurance exchanges, particularly for people who lost their jobs because of the unemployment crisis that came along with the pandemic. So I think the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare did a, a very good job of expanding coverage, but not to everyone. There were still a lot of people who fell through the cracks, not just in states that didn't expand Medicaid, but also because so much of our private insurance is tied to people's jobs. So going even further to have more access to care would be really important. We also uh, saw in the pandemic the huge gaps in our public health infrastructure, our surveillance, our ability to detect and react very quickly to increases in disease prevalence. I think the failures of that were in sharp relief. That's something we don't hear that much about, actually, I think, and that is the, the failures in the infrastructure of our public health system. Is there any move to have further investment? What kind of investments do we need across the country? And is it federal money? Is it state money? Where does it come from? I think we need more federal money and federal leadership on having consistent and really timely data reporting. Flying blind in this is a recipe for flare-ups that aren't addressed as quickly as they could be, and therefore much more draconian steps needed down the road. There needs to be a uniform infrastructure for reporting because the disease crosses state borders. Healthcare resources need to cross state borders. That said, the reaction to that information should be different in different jurisdictions, not only across different states, but in different cities or counties, rural areas, urban areas. There's very different healthcare conditions across the country and very different disease prevalence across the country. So I think we're going to need local reactions to be able to be really sensitive to local conditions, but we need national infrastructure for data collection, reporting, and redeployment of healthcare resources to where they're going to do the most good. Okay, thank you so very much. Always helpful to have you with us. That's Catherine Baker. She's University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy Dean. Up next, can Joe Biden bring out the Bernie Bros? We talk with former Sanders campaign manager Jeff Weaver. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The World Health Organization says the planet is nowhere near the amount of coronavirus immunity needed to induce herd immunity. That's where enough of the population, at least 70 percent, would have antibodies to stop the spread. WHO Emergencies Chief Dr. Michael Ryan largely dismissed that theory today, saying it's not a realistic solution. Most studies so far have suggested only about 10% to 20% of people have antibodies. Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered the 2016 hacking of Democratic Party accounts and the release of emails intended to harm Hillary Clinton's campaign. That's the conclusion of Senate Intelligence Committee in the final report of its Russia probe. The committee's investigation also found numerous contacts between Trump associates and Russians, as well as efforts by Donald Trump to take advantage of the leaks politically. But the committee says it did not find evidence of collusion between President Trump and Russia. Christia Freeland will become Canada's next finance minister. Bloomberg has learned that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will name Freeland to replace Bill Morneau. Morneau quit after a rift with Trudeau, proved impossible to repair. Freeland handled the negotiation of the North America Free Trade Agreement with the U.S. and Mexico. She would be the first woman to hold that position. 
UK and European Union officials have the next seven weeks to hammer out an agreement over their future relationship. After a brief summer hiatus, face-to-face -face discussions resume in Brussels today. The two biggest sticking points remain what access EU vessels will have to UK fishing waters and how closely Britain will have to stick to the bloc's rules to ensure a level competitive playing field. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Perhaps the most telling show of unity in the Democratic Convention last night came when Vermont Senator and former presidential candidate Bernie Sanders spoke. To everyone who supported other candidates in the primary and to those who may have voted for Donald Trump in the last election. The future of our democracy is at stake. The future of our economy is at stake. The future of our planet is at stake. We welcome now former Bernie Sanders campaign manager, Jeff Weaver. Mr. Weaver managed the campaign back in 2016. So, Jeff, thank you so much for being with us. The question I think on many people's minds, certainly Democrats' mind, is can Senator Sanders deliver his followers to support Joe Biden when it comes to voting November 3rd? Well, look, I, you know, it's great to be here, first of all, let me say that. But let me say this, that, you know, Bernie Sanders does not, quote, unquote, control his supporters, uh, nor does any other uh, political leader. Uh, but what he can do is, obviously, as he did last night, which is to provide an example, to uh, lay out uh, the threat that Donald Trump poses, not just to our economy, not just to the public health of this country, uh, but also uh, the fundamental threat he poses to our very democracy. Uh, and... Uh, rally people to go out in November and defeat Trump and elect uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. One of the things I think struck a lot of people last night was how full-throated the support from Bernie Sanders was for Vice President Biden. It was different from four years ago when it was Hillary Clinton. Is that because of the four years' experience of Donald Trump, or is something else different? Well, I think there are a number of factors at play here, one of which uh, obviously is the imperative to beat uh, Donald Trump. You know, Bernie Sanders is a very uh, historically aware of the danger that is posed by uh, authoritarianism, uh, both personally in his own family uh, and to the world. Uh, you know, Donald Trump is not an isolated phenomenon. We see authoritarian leaders rising up all over the world, uh, and that's something that has got to be defeated, particularly in a, a country that was known during the Second World War as, you know, the arsenal of democracy. Uh, to see uh, that kind of authoritarianism rising here is really a very dangerous uh, trend. In addition to that, you know, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden have a, a personal relationship which goes back many, many uh, years. And I, and I, you know, I do want to credit the Biden campaign uh, for reaching out uh, post uh, primary, you know, to reach out to not just to Bernie Sanders and his campaign, but to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, which is uh, increasingly a majority of the party, uh, to uh, find common ground around a number of issues. Uh, and to pledge to have an, you know, an open-door policy and a place at the table uh, for the progressive uh, wing of the party. So, so uh, Jeff, courting is one thing, moving is another. Do you think it's fair to say that Joe Biden has moved his substantive policy positions at least a tick or two in Bernie Sanders' direction? Has Bernie Sanders had that effect on the party and on the presumptive presidential candidate? Well, look, Bernie Sanders and his movement, uh, not Bernie Sanders alone, obviously, but the tens of millions of people who have voted for him and donated to him and campaigned for him and, and for other people. And we're seeing it in down-ballot uh, situations all over the country where uh, progressive challengers are winning against uh, more moderate incumbents. Uh, so there has been a tre tremendous sea change in the party, a very healthy change, which will in the long term will help the Democratic Party grow and, and reestablish itself as the dominant uh, party in this country. And that means looking out for the needs of working people, poor people, marginalized communities, you know, that's something we sort of lost in the 1990s with this, uh, you know, these so-called New Democrats who really took the party down a very uh, bad path and really destroyed the success that the Democratic Party had had since the New Deal. So I think the Demo modern Democratic Party is refining its roots. Uh, Bernie Sanders is playing a huge role in that. Uh, millions of people who are disgusted with the politics as usual in Washington are, are a part of that. Uh, and so you have seen a major change in the party. You know, if you look at the party platform in 16 and 20, it's a far more progressive document that we have seen uh, perhaps since the New Deal era.
We're going to hear from former President Bill Clinton tonight. Is what you're saying that this is at least a partial turning away from the Clinton direction? Well, if we're talking about Bill Clinton as opposed to Hillary Clinton. Yes, I was talking about Bill Clinton. People. Yes, um, uh, yes, I do. I, I, you know, it, there were a lot of things done in the 1990s, and uh, you know, uh, the free trade agreements, which you know really destroyed American manufacturing and hurt working class people. There was there were things like DOMA. There was the crime bill. Um, you know, there was "quote unquote" welfare reform. All of these things were, uh, you know, uh, uh, wedge issues that were designed to uh, pivot away from working class people of all races, and that really did long term damage to the party and the confidence that uh, everyday people have that the Democratic Party is standing with them and not with corporate elites. But we're seeing a change in that now. I do think Barack Obama should be credited with starting that uh, change, uh, although you know he was faced almost immediately with a huge uh, international financial calamity, which required. Uh, uh, his his attention, right. we should say. Um, but, you know, the party is rapidly moving. If you look at exit polls across yep. the country, in the Democratic primary, uh, yep. Medicare for All is wildly popular with Democrats, even with those Democrats who voted for Joe Biden. Fascinating. Really interesting take. Thank you so much for being with us to bring it to us. That's Jeff Weaver. He's former Bernie Sanders campaign manager. Coming up, nearly 30 years ago, it was the economy stupid when Bill Clinton ran for president. This time it's the economy again, but an economy that is tied to the progress of a pandemic. We talk with Steve Ratner of Will Advisors about the role of the economy and the virus in the election this year. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Democrats made it pretty clear last night that one of the major issues for them will be President Trump's handling of the coronavirus. For a read on that strategy, we welcome now Bloomberg's political contributor, Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital. So, Rick, great to have you with us. Give us a sense for your sense as someone who's run these presidential campaigns. Is this a smart strategy on the Democrats' part? Sure. I mean, they're going to define the election. Right? What are the stakes of the election? And when one of the stakes of the election can be uh, how do you tackle a global pandemic, it's pretty significant. It affects every uh, man, woman, and child in the United States. I mean, you couldn't get a more universal issue. And so making that day one uh, of their uh, national convention, I think, was a smart strategy. Obviously, the economy is intertwined with the uh, COVID response, and I think that suits the dialogue that the Democrats started last night very well. Well, but the President Trump keeps saying we're going to have a big rebound in the third quarter going to the fourth quarter that's really going to help me come November 3rd. Uh, what does he need to be able to turn that around to say at least we're in, headed in the right direction? Well, I would remind him that people start voting in North Carolina on September 4th. So he's running out of time in some of these states to get ahead of the election cycle. I mean, when you're only six weeks away from people turning in ballots and going to uh, voting booths, um, it's it, time's running short. Um, if he wants to bank on a rebound, that's a risky strategy. I think more importantly, I would think he'd want to focus on what are the things his administration are doing to avoid the crisis from getting worse and how to build jobs in the interim. OK, thank you so much to our political contributor, Rick Davis, who will be joining me again tonight for our coverage of the Democratic National Convention starting at 10 p.m. Eastern time. Well, as Rick just said, one of the reasons the pandemic may be affecting voters is the effect it has had on the economy, with President Trump promising a swift and strong rebound and others having begging to differ, I think it's fair to say. For a sense of where we are in the economy right now and where we're going, welcome now Stephen Ratner. He is chairman and CEO of Willett Advisors, which invests the personal and philanthropic assets of Michael R. Bloomberg, the founder and majority owner of our parent company. So, Steve, thanks so much for being with us. Give us a sense, because I hear conflicting things, frankly, that we're coming on the way back. We're out of the recession now. It's going to keep going. And other people saying, boy, not so fast. I think we've got some real bumps ahead of us. I think all of those things actually can be true, believe it or not. But let me just start by saying that as much as I was hoping to disagree with Rick Davis to make your show more exciting, I think he laid it out very clearly. Uh, the economy is almost always top of mind for voters uh, as they go to the polling booths, especially when you're in the middle of this kind of a crisis. But I do think this time around is a bit different in that I think the virus is very much front of mind for people. I think Trump's character is uh, very much and performance very much front of mind for people. And the economy, I've been quite surprised, has gotten less 
attention that I would have expected given what's going on. Um, to more directly answer your question, uh, as I said, I think all those things can be true at the same time. We, we have had a terrible, terrible recession, greatest recession since the Great Depression. Uh, but that said, the third quarter should show some positive growth. We have been adding jobs, admittedly, at a slower rate each month, and it's possible August will not be a great month for jobs. And so that's going to be the argument. It's, it's like what economists call a stock versus a flow. I mean, the Democrats are going to argue, but look where we are. The Republicans are going to argue, Trump's going to argue, yes, but it's getting better. Uh, I think the evidence is pretty clear that it's getting better far more slowly than the president, in a sense, promised everybody when he kept talking about V-shaped recoveries and the famous Jared Kushner quote in April saying the economy was going to be rocking in July. It certainly, not, certainly wasn't rocking in July uh, and so forth. And um, also, as Rick pointed out, there's early voting, but also I would point out that the third quarter GDP number that I think the president is putting a lot of hope on as part of his campaign only gets released on the Friday or the Thursday before the election. So it's three or four days before the election uh, when many people will have already voted that one of his best, uh, potentially best numbers may arrive. So, so, Steve, as someone who really invests money, is responsible for investing money, how do you invest in this climate with this much uncertainty that maybe it's coming back, maybe it's not, it'll take a longer time? What do you do? The, well, the real problem, the real challenge, investing is always a challenge, of course, in many respects, but this time around is different and more challenging because we are expected as investors to also become public health experts because so much of what we do will ultimately be driven by the path and course of this virus. If you tell me there's going to be a vaccine and we're going to essentially be back to a fully functioning economy in December, I would give you, I'd have one view. If you tell me it could be years, I might have another view. So it, it is the toughest uh, time to invest in my entire career. But look, we are long-term investors. I don't know how to do market timing. Every time I've tried, uh, it's not really worked well, or at least on balance, I don't think I've accomplished anything by doing it. And so we remain essentially more or less fully invested. We move some pieces around, try to uh, find the best opportunities. But uh, I do believe that in the fullness of time, markets go up, equity markets go up, and we should be in them. Uh, so it's awfully hard to be an investor and an epidemiologist at the same time, in my experience. But we all listen to these experts, medical doctors, others that come on, Dr. Fauci, others. Uh, what happens uh, to the economy? What happens to investments if, in fact, we don't get a vaccine at least any time soon, within the next two years or so? So certainly a vaccine that 100 percent cures this disease. But we do start to accommodate it. We learn to live with it almost like a chronic disease in our society. What is that? Does that make a material difference to investments into the economy? Yes, because I think what happens and what I worry about is that the economy, a certain amount of the economy will absolutely come back. Uh, people are working, jobs are being created, and so on. But that last 10 or 20 percent, which is absolutely essential to having a fully functioning economy, uh, the travel industry, the entertainment industry, all the things that the sports, all the things that bring people into closer contact may not come back under your scenario, in which case you have an economy that is limping along well below its full potential with unemployment that is quite high by historic standards and, and people getting increasingly uh, concerned, worried, and, and grumpy about it. So yes, that last 10 or 20 percent actually is the key to whether we have a full recovery or not, and that is dependent on whether people can go back to uh, not just working, but living, traveling, entertaining themselves, doing all the things they like to do as they were doing it uh, back in January and February. Uh, Steve, uh, come November 3rd, one of the things we're going to be deciding as a country is who gets to run the economy, so to speak, going forward. One of the criticisms that Democrats are making of President Trump right now is a question of competence. How competent has this government been in handling all sorts of things, including the economy? Last night we talked with Larry Summers and we asked him what difference really a Biden administration might mean. And he said it's competence and caring. This is what he said. We'd be competent again and we'd care again. We'd have a government that could carry out basic functions based on expertise, like all other countries do. So, Steve, as you look at what the Trump administration has done, and if we can put aside for a moment the policy or the ideology, just whatever they were trying to do, have they been competent in managing the economy and how they've done it? Are there things they could have done differently that could have helped us all? I agree with Larry. Uh, I think there is a lack of competence, certainly a lack of empathy or caring. So on competence, let's just take the most current 
uh, example that is right in front of us at this moment, which is the next phase of the stimulus or recovery or whatever you want to call it legislation. There's no doubt in any sane per uh, person's mind that we need another piece of legislation. We need to address the state and local problem. We need to address the testing problem. Um, we need more money for, uh, for things like PPP, uh, extended unemployment insurance. And the White House has been completely unable to even get its own caucus to any reasonable place, let alone uh, get a deal with the Democrats. As you know, the Democrats passed the HEROES Act back in May. Uh, it, was, I, it was certainly aspirational. I'm not saying it was the, uh, the piece of legislation that should become law, but it was a starting point. And it took until about three weeks ago for the Republicans to even have a counterproposal. And even then, it wasn't much of one. And now the president went ahead with these executive orders that, uh, putting aside whether they're legal or not, are really ineffective. We can go through them all, but they essentially are going to not address the problems in any serious way. And everybody has gone home. And I think that is a lack of confidence. So uh, are we facing a fiscal cliff? People talk about a fiscal cliff, uh, particularly because it's been now since uh, August 1, we haven't had, for example, the supplemental unemployment insurance. What could that do to the economy? By a fiscal cliff, you're, you're th what do you mean by fiscal cliff? If they don't In come up with a fiscal stimulus uh, uh, until late September, which some people are, think is quite possible. Well, uh, yes, a lack of, uh, of legislation is going to produce a serious fiscal drag on the economy. There's no question. As the unemployment uh, benefits run out and you go back to the low levels that we had before, as the PPP money runs out, as the state and local governments, and you can see this very clearly in the monthly unemployment numbers, uh, cut back to because they are required by law in most, almost every case to balance their budgets. It's an enormous drag on the economy, and that's what you are starting to see. Uh, you have had this deceleration in job growth. There are people who think August job numbers could be worse still, possibly little or no job growth. I don't know. I'm not here to make that prediction, but it's possible. So there's no question that the momentum of the economy is ebbing. If you look at things like credit card data, uh, it's plateaued at about 10 or 15 percent below last year's levels. And that gets back to what I was saying before about not achieving a full recovery. Uh, Steve, finally, you have uh, uh, substantial experience in Washington as well as in New York. How much of this is within the power of the administration or the president? And to what extent uh, would uh, President Biden, if it happened, that's what we're talking about this week because of the Democratic convention, if it happened, how much could he do without the Congress? It's limited. And I know there's obviously a big argument going on about executive authority and how much a president should, should or shouldn't have. But I can tell you, having worked in Washington, the president's authority in these areas is surprisingly limited, as we just saw. He came up with the best ideas he could, they could come up with that they thought were even vaguely legal uh, to do it on their own, and it really doesn't amount to much. So the answer is you have to work with Congress. And I think one of Joe Biden's strengths is his ability to work with the other side and to reach consensus. He's not a uh, terrible ideologue who says my way or the highway or things like that. He's, he lived in the Senate for so many years, and he knows how to compromise. And I'm not saying it'll be easy. We have two parties that are deeply, deeply polarized, reflecting the mood of the country. But I think he has a far better shot at pulling the, uh, the two sides together into some reasonable compromises than the current administration has been able to do. Okay, Stephen, thank you so very much. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. That's Steve Ratner. He's the chairman and CEO of Willett Advisors. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We are overdue for a check on the markets. Unfortunately, we have Bloomberg's Scarlett Fu here to fix that problem. Scarlett? Well, David, uh, the S&P 500 is on its way to a record close. We've gotten pretty close in the last couple of days, but couldn't quite get there. The number to watch here for the S&P 500 is 3386.15. That is the closing high set back on February 19th. If we are above that level, and right now we are, we'll get to a new record close. Well, one of the features of today's trading is the catalyst, which is better than expected economic data, this time for housing starts and building permits. And also there's continued improvement on the COVID front, particularly in the hotspot of Florida. So all that helping to continue feed into risky assets. And for the week, 
and it's only been two days this week. We've seen growth stocks take the lead once again. It's a little bit of a change from what we had seen the last two weeks when value stocks had outperformed growth and people were really looking for the rest of the economy to play catch up with some of the big cap tech names. ETF flows have shown that mo money is exiting growth stocks to the tune of $2.1 billion this month and moving into value $551 million. And David, uh, it is close to the end of earnings season, so we have to talk about retailers. And the results show that we have a pretty bifurcated industry. It all depends on whether you were able to open uh, for business during the pandemic or you had to close. If you had to close like Kohl's, uh, the pain was there, and you could see Kohl's down 16%. Walmart uh, doing a little bit better. Home Depot also, of course, uh, was able to open. But of course, they all faced higher expenses, uh, particularly when it came to making sure their employees were safe and they had to outfit their stores to make sure everyone was socially distanced. Okay, Scott, that was terrific. Thank you very much. It was worth waiting for that market check, I must say. Coming up here, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. And don't forget to tune into our special coverage tonight featuring speeches from President Bill Clinton and former Second Lady of the United States, Dr. Jill Biden, coming from the classroom where she taught. Well, the theme tonight is about leadership, and we'll hear from a series of speakers on that subject. That does it for Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.